So hi everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight as we talk about chiropractic care for active duty military and veterans. Nearly 20% of Americans suffer from chronic pain, including 65% of veterans. Additionally, veterans are two times more likely than non-veterans to die from accidental overdoses of highly addictive painkillers, according to the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. But there is hope. Doctors of chiropractic are uniquely poised to provide safe, effective, and drug-free care, and the president, presence of chiropractors with Veterans Affairs facilities is growing throughout the U.S. Tonight, we are lucky to have with us Dr. Jason Napoli and Dr. Christina Petroka, Petroko Napoli, who both work and have worked extensively providing chiropractic care to active duty military and veterans. Dr. Jason Napoli, it graduated from New York Chiropractic College in 2003 and completed a three-year integrated fellowship in 2006. This fellowship program included earning a master's degree in business administration with a healthcare concentration from Binghamton University in 2006. During his fellowship, Dr. Napoli worked in a variety of integrated healthcare settings in upstate New York, including Oswego Health Center and University of Rochester, Monroe Community Hospital. In 2006, Dr. Napoli began working in a VA at the Bass New York VA Medical Center, transferred to launch a new chiropractic program at Bay Pines VA HCS in 2013, and joined VA St. Louis Healthcare System Whole Health Initiative in 2018. He now serves as the Integrated Chiropractic Clinical Practice Residency Program Director. Over the course of working in VA, Dr. Napoli has overseen clinical services, supervised health professional students and residents, and has contributed in scholarly activities, including conducting research, publications, and national presentations. He is also certified in acupuncture. In addition, he has served on a variety of committees, including VA Ch Chiropractic Field Advisory Committee, IRB, and R&D committees and was a previous chair of the Pain Management Committee. Furthermore, Dr. Napoli has been involved in his profession and is a current and past chair of the Chiropractic Healthcare Section of the American Public Health Association, a member of the WFC Public Health Committee and Site Team Academy for the Council on Chiropractic Education. Dr. Napoli is also a major in the USAF assigned to an aero Aeromedical Evacuation Squadron and deployed to the Middle East in 2017 in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. That is Dr. Napoli. Dr. Petroko Napoli is the Assistant Dean for the College of Chiropractic. Dr. Petroko Napoli graduated from the University of Arizona with her degree in Physiological Sciences and later with her chiropractic degree from New York Chiropractic College. Following graduation from chiropractic college, she opened a practice in New York and shortly after began her postdoctoral fellowship in technique at New York Chiropractic College. During this time, she also achieved a master's degree in instructional design, development, and evaluation from Syracuse University. As an active member of the ACA, she is currently serving as the president for the Women's Health Council. She is also the Assistant Dean for the College of Chiropractic and is the Counselor at Large for the Council on Chiropractic Education. She has been actively involved in research related to pelvic pain in females and has authored both clinical and educational articles on this topic and others. Her practice and research focus include chronic pain in the female population, lower extremity amputees and gait, and integrative collaborative practice. For many years, Dr. Petroko Napoli has focused on the integration of practitioners in the patient-centered model of care and evaluating methods of effectively working on a team of healthcare professionals. This interest began many years ago while on an internship at the Camp Lejeune Naval Hospital Chiropractic Clinic. And during her time as the first female chiropractor commissioned as a captain in the New York State Guard, in addition, this has been reinforced by her involvement on multiple grant projects regarding the training of healthcare providers in inner collaborative care, and as an educator on a variety of topics related to chiropractic practice. She enjoys meeting practitioners from around the world. So without further ado, tonight's speakers, Dr. Napoli and Dr. Fotroko Napoli. 
Thanks, Stephanie. That was great. Really appreciate those introductions. Yes, thank you so much. So, Dr. Napoli, you're going to start us off and, and um, talk a little bit about uh, your perspective on, and give us some background on active duty military and then move us into um, what treatment might be like for the veterans. Yeah, I have to just move the screen out of there. There we go. Well, I'd just like to welcome everyone tonight. Thank you for taking some time to join us. Um, I think this is really an exciting opportunity, both uh, for you know you as students that are that are you know looking to become chiropractors and kind of I can share some of my experiences in VA, uh, and really so you can see a good outlook on where the future may may lie because this is really an exciting an op opportunity, uh, and there's some some pathways uh, that you can that you can um, do to get into the VA and or. DOD system. So it's a very unique population. It's certainly not for everyone, but I think after tonight, you'll have a good perspective on that and uh, be able to make some decisions as you um, move forward with your educational journey. So we'll go through a few slides if uh, you would like to, if, if there are, um, first, I'd just like to, to mention if there are any veterans uh, or active military on the, the call, I would like to just thank you for your service and dedication uh, certainly with Veterans Day coming up, it's important to, um, you know, be recognized for that. But uh, every day is important as well. So so uh, just to kind of start off with chiropractic and active duty military, um, you know, really it's a population that has a lot of musculoskeletal injuries. Certainly in the active duty population, you're going to see them uh, as being in, in almost 85% of all of the, the conditions that report to a, a military treatment facility are musculoskeletal related. Uh, they can occur as a result of battle. They can recur as a result of just non-battle, you know, daily PT activities, training. Um, you know, when, when someone is in, involved in conflict, uh, certainly there uh, brings uh, opportunity for things like small arms fire, missile strikes, you know, and on the VA side, we see this, you know, afterwards, years later, when they still have, you know, memory loss, and, you know, we call it traumatic brain injury, or polytrauma. And so these injuries often, you know, they are sustained, and they are acute, but the um, lingering effects of those can last for years. Um, you know, with particular with these explosions, you know, there are not um, any one particular type of condition or trauma that you see, it's usually multiple trauma, you know, fractures, you know, amputations, uh, significant memory loss, um, you know, night tremors, PTSD, and other kind of injuries. Uh, but also, you know, the non-battle injuries is someone being in the military for 20 years or even for five years, it really uh, plays in, in um, puts a big toll onto their joints and their musculoskeletal system as a whole. So you see that in both in VA and also in active duty. So when we talk about active duty military, you know, we're talking about the Department of Defense. And so Department of Defense has its own uh, healthcare system um, and that's slowly evolving over, over time. And now it's called the Defense Health System. And it's a very large health system. Uh, it serves, active duty military, but also serves their dependents and, and their um, and retirees. Uh, VA, on the other hand, is more of a uh, um, chronic pain, or, or shouldn't say chronic pain, veteran population, and in some circumstances, uh, your dependents, their dependents. So when we look at Department of Defense, we see that there are approximately 60 bases across the United States that have military treatment facilities that actually have a chiropractor that are, that's on staff. Uh, this began back in 1991. There was some legislation passed. They called it a demonstration project. And chiropractors began populating a lot of those, a lot of those bases. Uh, a lot of the active duty soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, Marines, you know, they seek chiropractic care uh, to supplement uh, or rehab themselves back to training and back to being what's called readiness. Uh, we use that term a lot on the military side. Uh, you have to maintain a level of readiness, which means you can deploy tomorrow if someone calls you to go. 
So musculoskeletal conditions being the largest condition that is seen in, a, in an active duty MTF, you know, chiropractors play a big role in getting those patients back into training and back into uh, their service and their roles. And chiropractors that are on staff at these MTFs, you know, for many years, they were contractors, they were uh, uh, brought on board by some third party contractor. But more recently, we're beginning to see a trend where the, the Department of Defense is actually hiring chiropractors as staff positions. And these are federal positions uh, that are um, available uh, for you or for graduates and, and for chiropractors. Next slide. When it, we come to the, the VA, the VA took some time. So you have this demonstration project that started in the early 90s and Congress began authorization to begin chiropractic care in 1999. Well, it took actually five years after that before chiropractors started becoming on staff. And in particular, two locations, one up in Buffalo and one in West Haven, Connecticut, both started chiropractic services in 2004. And over the course of time, that's slowly evolved. And so there's been some additional legislation that, that has come about. And the initial legislation said that there would be 23 chiropractic providers across the country uh, serving our veterans. And, and we, our veterans are, are, the VA has broken up into what's called uh, veteran integrated service networks, and there's 23 of them across the country. And so one chiropractor within every network. And more recently, there's been additional legislation that has passed that has now said that, you know, up to 50% of all uh, facilities should have a chiropractor on board. And so that's slowly evolving. Um, but as you can see, there's approximately 200 chiropractors and 140 facilities that currently have chiropractors on, on staff. You know, the facilities that don't have chiropractors on staff uh, usually refer into the community. And so there's an opportunity as a, as a um, private practitioner to work closely with the VA and see those veterans that are there. Next slide. Um, so chiropractic service is part of the standard medical benefits package. So, you know, we're, oh, go back. So we're, we're not, um, what, what that means that that's, that's important is that all veterans who have access to VA healthcare, chiropractic care is part of that standard benefit. It's not something that's a nice to have, it's, it's, it's a need to have. It's part of the basic medical coverage that is provided to veterans. Uh, primarily, we serve as a diagnosis and management of non-operative neuromuscular and musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, we see a lot of low back pain, neck pain, headaches, uh, shoulder, and extremity conditions as well, but our primary focus is, is back pain. Throughout VA, there's various uh, organizations. Uh, the, or, the chiropractors are organized into various departments. Uh, from a VA central office, which is in Washington, D.C., we're aligned under physical medicine and rehabilitation. And facilities across the country, uh, though that alignment is either part of uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, but they can also be part of primary care, they can be part of a surgical service, uh, they can also be part of whole health and the whole health initiative, which I'll talk to you a little bit about. And our scope of practice really allows us to do a variety of, of different uh, procedures, you know, obviously spinal manipulation, uh, but also manual therapies, uh, recommendation of, of um, you know, various imaging, referrals, uh, ordering of labs, um, and, and really just being, you know, being able to manage the patient you know, through nutrition, through well-being activities, through lifetime, lifestyle adjustments. Uh, all of those things are part of our scope of practice, and we were able to fulfill all of that as a provider in VA. Yeah, this, this gives you a little bit of demographics. This is more uh, recent and up to date uh, with the demographics of the VA chiropractic providers. I don't have them for the DOD, but I do understand that the DOD is a lot younger uh, and, a, and a lot much more younger practitioner in there. But VAV, uh, VA, we seem to have a, a, a little bit of an older population. I don't want to say 46 is old because that's kind of around my age, but certainly it's, it's uh, kind of middle of the road. Uh, average is 5.5 years in VA. 
you know, I, I've, I've been in VA for almost 15 years now. So that's, there's still a, a, a younger group of, of folks that are coming through. We do have a large percentage of females. Uh, we do have a percentage of veterans and, and VA really does like to hire veterans. Uh, it's, it's, you know, chiropractic is not a, con, um, is a not a competitive uh, work um, position. So, you know, we're able to select the best practitioner, but there are circumstances where, you know, veterans are um, giving first priority uh, within four VA positions. Uh, salary really ranges from approximately 65. It's, it's the general schedule scale. Uh, so if you have access to that, you can look it up. You can see what your local VA or local government job will pay. But the, the salary range is anywhere from 65 to 165. And that's, you know, based off of experience, uh, based off of, of your, your professional growth and development, your scholarly activities, and really the complexity of the position that you have in VA, you know, you can justify the higher um, uh, salaries. And it really is competitive. It's approximately 1% uh, selection rate. You know, any job that, that opens on VA, you know, we'll have hundreds of applications for that position. It, it's a really arduous task, but we, we do really aim to, to choose the best person uh, when, that, um, uh, when those postings are out there. And somewhat uh, very exciting and, and developing over the last, since 2014, you know, VA has an actual residency that uh, occurs and it's a paid residency, a chiropractic residency that's within VA. Uh, initially it was five sites that were across the country and more recently that's expanded to 10 sites. So there are you know, 10 chiropractic residents across VA that are currently working. It's a one year residency that's available and a really awesome opportunity. And, and one of the nice things is that over the course of the last six years, the residents that have graduated from the program have all gone on to work in VA. And so we, we expect, because of the um, increase in VA residencies, we certainly expect that trend to continue. And St. Louis is a site for VA, for a VA residency, correct? Yeah, yeah. So there, there are 10, 10 locations across the country. Um, there, there um, I, I could probably pull up a map, but uh, St. Louis is, is one of them. Uh, St. Louis was one of the original residency locations back in 2014. Uh, we just went through our accreditation cycle. We, we were reaffirmed for another six years, just, just last year. So we are um, uh, one of those sites. In addition to that, uh, there are two sites in New York, uh, one in Buffalo, one in the Finger Lakes. There is a, a location in West Haven, Connecticut, and Los Angeles. Those are the five original sites. And then more recently, just in the last year, uh, we added Iowa City. We added uh, Puget Sound, which is up in uh, Seattle, Washington area. We added... Lo um, uh, Palo Alto, which is out in California. We added Cincinnati uh, in Ohio, and then Miami, Florida. So those are the five expansion sites that are currently um, online, so 10 total. So you mentioned earlier about whole health. Can you expand on that and explain um, what that is and what that initiative is within the VA and what that means for patient care? Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question. So one of the, the, the things that uh, drew me to St. Louis, uh, you know, there's a couple of, couple of things, uh, but whole health initiative. Now, whole health initiative, you can, you can type that in, look it up. But in 2016, uh, VA identified 16 sites to become flagship sites. And then over the course of the last year, we, we have been funded to implement a whole health transformation. And, and really, when you look at whole health, or you, you, you think of the word whole health, you think of whole body. So chiropractic is part of that. And so what we're aiming to do is really transform the medical care that's delivered in VA from a sickness care, right? So the veteran gets sick, they go see the doctor to a wellness and quality of life, improvement of quality of life based um, health care. Which, which involves a lot of different people. So at the core center of whole health is the veteran. 
And what we do is we actually ask the veteran to identify, do a, do a self inventory, they call it a personal health inventory, and also do what's called the MAP, the mission aspiration uh, of, of that veteran. And so through that, they understand where they are on the healthcare spectrum, where they are and where they wanna go. We establish goals with them. And when I say we, I, I'm talking whole health, uh, the, the initiative itself. Uh, they'll establish goals with them, and then they work with that veteran through a variety of different classes and services. So within our department, we have 55 people that we have on staff within Whole Health, and we have uh, providers that are trained in integrative medicine and holistic medicine, and so they serve as, a, as um, you know, their uh, nurse practitioners and physicians. And they serve as a, um, a collaborative approach to managing very complex conditions. Uh, those patients that are on uh, opioids and are looking to reduce opioids, but those that also have chronic pain for many years, you know, they're, they're part of the integrative medicine team. Within that team, there's mind-body medicine, there's hypnosis, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's uh, mindful-based stress reduction, there's um, biofeedback, there's aromatherapy, there are um, healing touch, and the list goes on and on. And so that's part of that clinical care. Chiropractic care, we have four chiropractic providers. We have the resident, we have uh, three acupuncturists, and we have um, a couple of massage therapists. And so we're part of the clinical team. We all work together with the patients. But supporting us is probably the most important feature of whole health, and that's our classes. So we have well-being classes. And through the classes, veterans participate within, the, within these classes. Uh, they, one is called Taking Charge of My Life. It's a six-week class. Veterans go in, they, they find out what matters most to them. They work through different group scenarios, and they really leave there with an appreciation of where they are now and where they'd like to be. They set goals that are focused on quality life. Uh, in addition to that, we have activities um, such as nutrition, functional nutrition, anti-inflammatory uh, diets, elimination diets. Uh, we have six, eight-week classes where veterans are enrolled in that and they go through um, that. Um, we have um, yoga, tai chi, we, we have chair yoga, we have mat yoga, we have tai chi. And a lot of these things you can look on wellvets.com, which is our St. Louis site itself and through there you'll see a variety of videos that have all been posted on there from our well-being um, um, staff but also we have coaches and peer support specialists and those folks are very important to us because they talk with the veterans every week and they encourage them along their journeys so once a veteran um, identifies where they want to go and what they want to do and how they're going to get there the coaches their personal coach. They meet with them on a weekly basis. They find out where they're going, uh, what they're doing, but more importantly, how can we continue to help you? And so I, I can, you know, share some initial preliminary data with, with you from that, and that we've been able to show just on, you know, veterans that are enrolled in whole health, you know, in uh, upwards of 45% have been able to completely come off opioids and, you know, move on to almost non-pharmacological treatment for their chronic pain conditions. And, you know, the idea is that over time that we develop a healthier veteran, which in the long run will uh, save money, but also avoid future costs that, that may be occurred. And really, we'd like this to trickle into the private sector, because, you know, if you think about private sector healthcare, it's, it's, um, it's reactive healthcare. You get sick, what do you do? You go to urgent care, you go to the doctor. Um, we're looking to really be proactive about this, give people the necessary tools they need to be healthy, to be successful, and they won't need to go to urgent care as much anymore. They won't need to have that burden on, on the healthcare system. But also the healthcare system focuses on improving quality rather than improving reimbursement. And I think that's a huge um, thing to accomplish. So we're hopeful and it's working out well. Uh, we've we've established our flagship site. We're probably the most robust in VA. 
uh, but others are, are following suit. And so hopefully in time, you know, this will begin to trickle out into the, into the private sector as well. So Doc, that's a great explanation of how we can help our veteran patients and the type of care they might receive in a facility. Now, I guess the next question I have for you is the prospective students that are on the line, how as they enter into chiropractic school, can they get involved with learning about care of veterans and you know, how can they potentially set themselves up for a future residency or a position at a VA facility? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's another good question. You know, I, I often, you know, think of, you know, young students, they're entering into the chiropractic profession, you know, there's a world of opportunity out there. You know, you can, you can leave chiropractic school, you can go into private practice, you can be very, very successful in your community. Um, you can, you know, you can work hard and do that. But you, you can also, you know, go into these hospital based uh, practice settings. And these are going to only improve in over time, not only within VA, but also within private sector. And as I, I mentioned earlier, it's really about that shift of, you know, sick care to being proactive and preventive, preventative care. And so if these are your goals that you want to do, you know, in, in, in anything in, in, in your career, you want to be proactive. You want to be able to say, you know, this is my goal. I want to work in VA or I want to work in a hospital. And then you set yourself up for success. You surround yourself with like people. You be progressive. And I, I, when I lecture to students on campus, I put up a slide and I say, how do you stand out in a room of 200? And so if at the end of the day, as you're working through you know, your schooling, how do you stand out? How do you stand out in class? What have you done to you know, read the literature? What have you done to participate across campus? What have you done to be a leader? You know, these are the folks that are getting into these positions. These are the ones that are, you know, leaders in our profession. And so, you know, with that in mind, you know, think about what you want to do and how you want to set yourself up. Read the literature, read, read evidence-based care, you know, get very involved in that and how you can, you know, focus your treatment and your learning around that. You know, get involved in some research, you know, as a, as a student uh, in training and seek out residencies, you know, really look, you know, at the residency as a, as a, as an opportunity, um, you know, and, and keep your grades up. You know, those are all things that, that are really, you know, ideal when it comes to, you know, setting yourself up for success. So how about clerkships, thoughts on, um, you know, advanced techniques, um, you know, learning different skills, being involved on campus. What's your thoughts on those? Yeah, all, all of all those, those are all important. You know, in VA, we don't have any, we don't subscribe to any one technique more than the other. We do what's best. It's, it's veteran centered. You know, if a veteran comes in and they've <coughs> have had previous success uh, seeing a chiropractor and that chiropractor did activator, well, we'll do activator with that veteran. There's no reason to convince them that, you know, the latest and greatest in technique is going to heal them because they have their, their minds and they have previous experience of success with a particular treatment. Same thing goes if someone has seen a chiropractor and they've had diversified or, you know, what we consider high velocity, you know, the traditional spinal manipulation where you lay on your side and, you know, you, you, you get your, 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 your uh, bones cracked, if you will. Um, you know, again, that's something that we do. We don't necessarily subscribe, but more importantly is that we try to ensure that each veteran comes in, their treatment approach and their plan um, really focuses on, you know, the, the best of the evidence that's out there. So we do soft tissue technique and we don't necessarily subscribe to any one technique more than the other uh, when it comes to soft tissue, but something that works and that's effective. Um, you know, the same thing with prescribing exercises, you know, veterans and active military, they're two different types of, of people. So you think of active military as being the athletes and you think of the veterans as being the retired athletes. You know, once they were lean and mean in a fighting machine, but now not so lean and now not so mean, right? So, you know, there, there's a different approach to them. So you may give an active duty um, service member a dozen exercises to do and have the expectation that they're going to do them. Whereas a veteran, you may just give them one or two because you know that they have a learning curve and that they need to slowly work into it. 
So, you know, understanding what exercise instruction is, how that's important, um, the, pro the progression of exercise that you're not going to give, you know, someone, you know, a dozen exercises that can't handle it, but, you know, you have to have that expectation. So it's really the veteran centered approach. You know, what's the best evidence? What is the veteran uh, need? And what do you think is going to benefit them the best? So, you know, when you're in school, you learn a little bit of everything. Um, you know, there's, there's great techniques, there's great soft tissue, there's great exercise rehabilitation classes. These are all important because you're going to use some component of them at some point in the future. Can you also touch a little bit on, um, you know, some of our Logan students have rotated through the VA with you and mm -hmm. they've had an experience. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when that happens for some of the Logan students and what that looks like for them in a typical day? Yeah, yeah. So we, we have a, an ongoing rotation with, with Logan and, and with the students that they come through. And um, currently we, we select uh, approximately 10 students a year that will come through VA St. Louis. And so, you know, the rotations uh, really vary. And, and we'll, we'll go back to talk about pre-COVID because during COVID they've, they've changed a little bit just because we're not physically, you know, in our same space that we once were. But um, a typical day is, you know, you arrive at 7.30 in the morning and uh, you stay until the last note is done. And that's usually about 4, 4.30 in the, in the evening. And, um, you know, we see anywhere from 17 to 20 patients is usually a, a you know, pre-COVID uh, is usually our, our usual, usual um, volume. And, um, you know, we work alongside you and, you know, students, you know, we they work with us in the room, they work with us with the patient. Uh, you may, you know, take the history, we'll share the exam, and then when it comes to treatment, you know, we usually split that up as well. Uh, first and foremost, the veteran, you know, is getting care, and, and secondly, the student is, is going to get some great education, see some real complex cases, and, you know, have an opportunity to practice some of the things that they've been learning all along. So we, we routinely have taken ninth trimester students and they come, they spend approximately four to six months with us. But more recently, we've, we've been talking about taking any student, uh, even eighth tri students to come in maybe for a shorter rotation, uh, four to six weeks uh, rather than four to six months. But we're, we're still gonna maintain a student presence uh, for four to six months uh, for select students. And, and really these clerkships are important because you know, and, and VA St. Louis, obviously we're local to Logan, so we, we try to be very robust with our student rotation, but Logan has a lot of relationships with many VAs across the country. And so just because you don't, you know, want to you know, stay in St. Louis, maybe you're from Cincinnati, or maybe you're from Utah, or Arkansas, or Southern Illinois, um, you know, these are all locations that Logan has affiliations with, so certainly that would or, or Nashville too. So if you want to return back to your home and do a preceptorship, that's an opportunity as well. And so clerkship really sets you up for whether you're going to do a preceptorship later down the road uh, or do a VA um, uh, residency at some point. All of our VA residents currently um, have had previous clerkships in VAs across the country. So that's, that's a growing trend as well. And I, I'll also speak to the DOD side because, you know, VA or Logan does have relationships with uh, VA uh, or DOD centers, certainly Scott Air Force Base, and I know they send uh, three or, or two or three students over there as well. So that's another opportunity. Yeah, we do. We, we send students to Scott Air Force Base, and we also send some students to Walter Reed. Um, yeah, you know, I'm yeah. going to comment a little bit and um, maybe steal the show from you for just a second. But, sure. you know, in, in, you know, my past experience, and I want to share this with the group, but when I was a student, um, it, I finished off the end of my chiropractic education at Camp Lejeune, and you may have heard that in, in the intro bio that Stephanie gave. And, you know, during that time, I, I didn't come from a military family. Um, I didn't know anything about, about really what it meant to treat um, this population. And, you know, I spent my time there working in the chiropractic clinic and, and working 
rotating through hospital-based settings. And it, it really helped me focus on how I would treat patients in the future. And you know, one of the other big things that, that is, is really fascinating, and I often tell students this, that when I was there, I had an amazing mentor, um, Dr. Clay, and he is actually now at the Cincinnati VA. He's moved from the DOD side and is now treating veterans. And so he's seen that care from, from both aspects. And, you know, I, I think that when we look at the care of, like you said, those that are active duty, they're like an athlete. And, you know, then they progress and we still see veterans that, that you know, were once an athlete and some may still have a little bit of their athletic ability within them that you do treat. Um, but the other thing is, and I, and I want to make sure that everyone's aware, because a lot of times when we think about veterans or we think about active duty, we think a lot about males, when actually there are both males and females that are veterans and active duty. So, um, you know, just, just keep that on the forefront of your brain that, you know, the population, I think, has changed significantly from what it was in the past. And again, with all of the different opportunities that are available to you as a student to do rotations, to move into potentially a residency, if this is the direction that you want to go, um, you know, and, and, and beyond. So, so that, that, that really just kind of sums up with what some of the great aspects of care related to these populations are. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Doc, if you have anything to jump off of from there. No, I think that's great perspective. It's, it's um, you know, and I, I'll, I'll just mention that, you know, Cincinnati is uh, one of the residency sites and also a rotation with uh, Logan. So that's an opportunity to work with Dr. Clay uh, there as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, so you talked a little bit about, you know, preparing. And I think one of the other things that I think is really important, um, you know, for students, you mentioned being a leader and, you know, we, we're leaders made at Logan and, and we offer a variety of opportunities for students to do that through different activities on campus, whether it's being involved in student government or being involved in a club, but all of those things, you know, really do fit your profile as you move into being a professional and being a practitioner. And, and, and you mentioned that early on. And, and I think that's really important that when, wherever you decide to go as, and become a practitioner, you're on that journey to become a practitioner and all of the things that you do consistently build that profile for you. Um, you know, so whether it is you're applying to a residency or your first job in chiropractic, you're using all of those things that you took from your academic institution to make you that practitioner. Mm -hmm. And also I would add to that, it's passion. I think passion is important to, to think about, you know, when, whether you want to go in a private practice or work in an integrated setting, you know, you're embarking upon an exciting career and one that has many doors that that could open for you. But, you know, it's this is not just a job, you know, it's a career. And with that is a passion, you know, treating veterans, treating active military, treating any type of patient, you know, it's, 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 there's a passion involved in that, you know, you, you have to like people, you have to be able to be good with people uh and and lead them and influence their their lifestyle choices and and that's that's you know different than just taking a job and being a technician and you know kind of doing you know the mundane um things every day this you know being in healthcare and being a professional really does uh, passion is important in that so I, I think we're at that point that um we can take a look and see if there's any questions i'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, see if anybody in the group has any chat questions for us. Don't all ask at once now. I will definitely ask a question if that's okay. I am obviously a current student, so hopefully that's okay. I don't know if this is of just course. for. Okay, so awesome. So I was wondering if you could speak on a little bit. Obviously you're in an integrated setting. Could you talk a little bit about how does that work? Do um, patients need to be referred to you? Can they come into their PCP asking for chiropractic care? Um, and then after that, once they see you, um, how are you working with other uh, practitioners within the hospital once you have that patient? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so yeah, it is, you know, VA, in VA and in DOD, chiropractic providers are considered specialists. 
just like a rheumatologist, a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, you know, all of those, they're all, we're all considered specialists. So we have the primary care gatekeeper model where every veteran has a, a primary care provider that they're assigned. And through that provider or through any provider, they could access, you know, additional care. So for instance, if a patient came in to see their primary care provider on their yearly checkup, you know, hey, how you doing, Mr. Jones or, or Ms. Smith? I'm doing great, doc. You know, I, I you know, my eyes have, are changing, my vision, you know, I, I, I think I need some new glasses. You know, my hearing's going and my back's been bothering me. And so what is the primary care provider? Well, they, they send them off to optometry, or ophthalmology, they'll send them over to audiology, and then they'll send them to chiropractic care, or in our case, send them into whole health, because we're trying to get them to, trying to get the providers to, to really push the, the idea of whole health. So they come through that mechanism. Um, additional mechanisms that they'll come through is if a patient uh, has, you know, maybe had some significant trauma and they've tried a variety of different things, they just haven't worked and they've reached up to neurosurgery. Neurosurgeon's like, hey, you know, I'm not going to operate on you. Uh, you need to go see the chiropractors or you need to try, you know, physical therapy. So then we get a referral from, from that provider. Um, and so it comes through, it could come from any specialty provider and it can come from a primary care provider. You know, we average, uh, you know, I'll just give you some rough numbers. Um, we average about, about 35, 40 new patients a week, um, that, that we could, we could see. Uh, and so that's, you know, 160 new patients a month. You know, if you have a private practice that's seeing 160 new patients a month, you're doing something really, really good, right? So the national averages for, for progress for a, a growing practice is one to two new patients a day. So we, we're, we're at 160 for the month. So we're, we're, we're at capacity. Oftentimes, a lot of the VA clinics, they book out three months in advance, which then is a, it creates an opportunity because VA doesn't like any veteran waiting around more than 30 days. So then those veterans end up going into the community. So there's patients that say, no, no, I want to see the VA provider. And then there are those that'll say, no, no, I can't wait. And then they'll just go into the community. So that gives a nice opportunity for private practitioners to work with VA and see veterans on the outside. So, you know, if a, if a patient comes to me and I, through my evaluation and um, workup, I determine that they're not a chiropractic patient or that their pain is really not a musculoskeletal condition, that there's something more, I can order the labs, I can order the imaging, and I can refer to any provider in the facility. And this is a, a very kind of a, uh, a harmonious relationship where, you know, we have, we're all connected on a EHR, uh, electronic health record, and we have uh, Skype, it's, it's now Microsoft Teams, but I can simply write a note to the doctor and say, hey, Dr. Jones, I'm sending you know, Ms. Smith to you uh, for X, Y, and Z. Um, and so that, you know, creates an opportunity for, you know, some kind of direct communication. There's also indirect communication where you type your note and then you, um, identify additional signature on your note as that as a provider that you want to send a patient to. <clears throat> so they'll go ahead and they'll have to, that note will come up on their alert box. They'll have to go in and read it and then sign it at the bottom. And so a lot of times if we see a patient for, you know, a series of treatments and they respond or they don't respond and we discharge them, we'll go ahead and, and um, copy that provider on that note so they could, uh, they're aware of that. <clears throat> so it really works out in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, phone call through um, the uh, texting, uh, the IM system, or through the note. But it's 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 been a great relationship. You know, a lot of providers. I, I you know remember the first time I I presented to a medical staff, and, and this well not the first time, but one time. Uh, they asked me to present to the primary care medical staff. So this was like 150 physicians. And I got up there and I spoke for 45 minutes and talked about chiropractic care. 
And, you know, I, I ended up using up a lot of time and they lined up in the back of the room to ask questions. I mean, they could just not throw enough questions at me and all great questions. Most of them were, how do I get my patients to see you? You know, what do I need to do to see you? Um, and, and so, you know, it's just more of them understanding the process on how to identify a patient, um, but also how they can, can uh, get to see us. Uh, there's there's a, a, a unique opportunity because, you know, if you think about the large demand, right? So, you know, you're seeing 30 new patients a week and you constantly have new patients coming into your office. But you also recognize that some patients just need exercise. They just, just need to do some stretches. And so we've, we've at times, have made it easy for providers. We've given them little stretching handouts. If a patient comes in with chronic back pain, give them this first. And if they don't respond, then we'll, we'll see them. And so that's been a way to kind of uh, mitigate and not, um, you know, have some extra volume coming into our clinics. And that's been well received because now the, you're giving the provider, the primary care provider, a tool that they can use in their office to give to their patient. So that's worked out well, too. I hope that answered it if you have any other yes, questions. Yes, it definitely did. And I think you answered some of my other questions as well, because I was just going to ask, you know, are other um, practitioners, are they open to chiropractic? And, you know, is it just a lack of knowledge and they maybe just haven't, um, you know, been fully educated with it? And if so, how do you tackle that? How do yeah. you, um, you know, are they pretty receptive to what you're doing? And if so, you know, how do you go about that? Um, if not? Yeah, so, you know, in VA, it's, it's, we really, we have a veteran, veteran-centered approach. So we want the veteran to be able to have the best care possible. And so with that comes the idea of trying things that may be non-traditional. And, you know, chiropractic care may fall under that umbrella, although, you know, we are, we're kind of out of that umbrella where we're just part of the mainstream, you know, healthcare that's delivered to the veterans. So really it comes with education and time and just delivering, you know, good quality care, uh, delivering good documentation, and providers just developing the knowledge that they have from you that you share with them. And so in our notes, you know, we make it a point to when we talk about our assessment, which is our diagnosis, you know, we really, we just don't put back pain. You know, we put, you know, biomechanical, you know, dysfunction, we put, you know, deconditioning, core stabilizers, you know, degenerative changes, you know, whatever it is, what we usually put a comprehensive assessment. So we, in our attempt to educate the provider on, okay, yeah, this is back pain, but it's, you know, it's, it's not arthritis. You know, yeah, they have some arthritis, but that's not what's causing their back pain. Um, yeah, they have some findings on x-ray or they have some findings on MRI, but that's not contributing to their back pain. This is what's contributing to their back pain. And so this is our focus. And so, you know, but being part of the culture, you know, we attend grand rounds. Um, we are, we're, um, you know, our clinic, we have residents, medical residents from uh, SLU and Washington University that rotate through our clinic. They spend a day uh, with us. And so through that, you know, we are able to educate them uh, one by one. Uh, so that's, that's a great avenue, giving them a lecture. We've, we've done some of their clinical conferences where we've, we talk about, you know, just what's the best evidence in the treatment of chronic back pain? Does it, it's not about being a chiropractor or sending people to the chiropractor for chiropractic. It's about, no, this is what the evidence shows. And evidence shows that the exercise is important. Spinal manipulation is important. Lifestyle change is important. Nutrition is important. You know, encouraging movement, encouraging, you know, that everything's going to be fine. All of these things are important and supported by the evidence. So, you know, being a, a professional that could educate the practitioners on best practices is important. Um, and so they're very receptive to that. And that's part of just developing, becoming part of the culture uh, within that. So we got a few Wonder. questions in the chat box. Oh, Hope, did you oh. have another question? Go for it. No, I was just gonna say thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. These are great questions, Hope. Thank you for asking. Yeah, you've got, you've got a few questions going on in the chat box here. Um, right. You know, when you speak, one of them is, when you speak about a hospital setting, is there an opportunity to be, an, to be on call in the ER? So let's see, when you speak about a hospital setting, is there an opportunity to be on call in the ER? Yeah, so, so yes. So in short, there is opportunity for that. 
the currently ER is where COVID is showing up, so we're not part of the ER. Um, however, what we're currently part of is uh, the resident urgent care clinic. So all musculoskeletal cases are actually being diverted from ER and they're moving into the resident um, urgent care clinic. And that's staffed by all the residents from Washington University and SLU, but also our Logan University um, chiropractic resident, he is up there as well. So that is an opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, there are examples across VA of chiropractors uh, being on staff in, in, in the ER or just working a, a shift. Um, because we do recognize that more than half of presenting cases or presenting complaints to an ER are musculoskeletal in nature. And so having the chiropractor on staff there uh, to at least evaluate the patient is, is a great idea. Uh, we do plan to, at some point, go back to doing that or, or at least having that opportunity to do that here at VA St. Louis. We do have an ER. Uh, we did propose it. Actually, just as COVID was starting, we actually proposed it and it was well received. And so, you know, you know, we have our clinic is, is on the eighth floor and the ER being on the ground floor. It would be very easy for the provider to give us a call and come on down. I have a patient. We would evaluate them, bring them upstairs. Uh, or just fit them into the next um, uh, available slot. If you think about a traditional ER visit, you know, if a patient comes in and they have some, they have a condition that needs follow-up, usually the ER physician will uh, recommend a follow-up with si such specialty service within 72 hours. And so that's something that we would, we would consider as well. So lots of different examples, plenty of opportunity to do that. Uh, and, and I think that's a very, very important piece that, that we can um, uh, be part of uh, in the future. If you don't mind me, can I add on to that? Yeah. Um, so I'm an EMT currently, and that's, that was my question. My question had a couple other ones, but um, are you needing like a certification for that? For that like EMT paramedic because that's my goal is to get my paramedic when I'm done because being in the army like you just want to keep training so sure. do you want to do you need that for that yeah. opportunity or so so I was an EMT right and I, I kept my EMT while I was in Cairo school and volunteered and then um, worked and in, in had my certification afterwards is it necessary to work in an ER to be a, a chiropractor with an EMT certificate? No, because you think of scope of practice. You know, you, you can't function as an EMT and a chiropractor at the same time, right? So if you're work, working as an EMT, you have to work as an EMT. If you're working as a chiropractor, you have to work as a chiropractor. So I can give you an example of, of how those two blend together. So I, I had an opportunity to work at a local uh, community college in upstate New York. And so I used my EMT on the days of games. People, the athletes got injured. I ran out on the field. I bandaged them up. I set, I didn't set their fractures, but put them in splints. Uh, if they had you know, concussion symptoms, I was able to do a screen. I would activate EMS. I would do all of those things and I would even tape them up before the game. And I would do that during the games. After the games or during the week when there weren't games, I would function as a chiropractor in their, in their athletic department. And so that worked out very well. I was able to use kind of both certifications, but I served in, I wasn't a, um, doing spinal manipulation on the field before the game, but I would do it in the athletic department, you know, two hours before the game. But once the game was in place, I was there to be, an EMT. But having that knowledge as an EMT is, is great because it really gives you a, an understanding of emergency medicine and, you know, how to you know, get the patient from the pre-hospital setting to the hospital. And, and you know, you'll, you'll get some experience with that in chiropractic school, but the EMT covers it much more in depth. As you said, you're an EMT now? Yes, currently. Um, I just have my certification. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, we have to research next year, so we might as well know. Yeah, and then if you decide to become a paramedic, you know, I, and just to kind of, you know, speak 
about that. If you know, say you, you wanted to, to, you know, start practice and you needed to, you know, work and do something while you started practice to pay your bills. You know, being a paramedic is a wonderful job to be able to, you know, go and do that. When I when I was in college, I I was when and working as an EMT, I'd go in and work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like a 36 hour straight shift, and I would go to school Monday through Friday. And it was great because I had a full-time job and that paid well, but I was able to go to school at the same time. So, you know, think about that as, you know, if you decide to do private practice or even just getting your foot in the door, you know, of a, of a local emergency department, you know, being, having a presence there and, you know, being part of that could be very helpful to that. So. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, um, sure. So, I had an awesome end of service, and then like two months later, we ended up starting school. Um, I will have a break in service, but I want to go back in. How mm -hmm. does that correlate, like you being actively serving and then being a chiropractor starting out? <laughs> yeah, that's tough. There's no 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 easy way, um, no easy answer to that. It's it's you know it's a dedication and sacrifice for serving your country, and you know thank you for that. Um, there's you know some sacrifices with that because if you know you you do have to do training and drill and you that will take you away from private practice um, you know working in a, like a VA setting or DOD you know they do allow for that and they, you're you know there's no you know, we, we get time off to do that and and you know it's actually it's not that it's encouraged it's certainly not discouraged you know they're very supportive of that you know any any um, employer would be supportive of that because that's you know there's there's laws that that protect you from you know serving and you know coming back to your job once you're once you're done with that so you know it's it's um you know but starting a private practice if, if that's something you were doing and then you had to leave for for six months that would be very tough chiropractors have done it and they continue to do it but you, you'd have to have enough of a foundation in your practice where you can walk away, trust your office staff uh, to manage the practice and, and, you know, have an associate there that would run it uh, well. So, and there are providers that have done that in the, in the past and, and do that. Okay. Just want to say thank you. And thank you for your service. Yeah. Well, thank you. This. Thanks for your support. Jack, you have another question. I know we're getting close on time, but I think oh. um, this is this is one on, on focusing on women and children at within the VA facilities and um, active members, veterans, independents. I don't know if you can address that one before we wrap up for the night. Yeah. So, so women, yes. So VA has a large women female population. It's currently about twelve percent. Um, however, that's actually expected to grow. And certainly here in VA St. Louis, it's going to grow to over twenty-five percent. Uh, by 2030. So having a focus, we have a women's clinic. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to have a women chiropractor on staff uh, to uh, really focus on women that do come in. So for me, it's a it's a win win. Um, children's care within VA is just we don't have any um, really no opportunity for that. We don't even have uh, an OB provider in VA. We have um, GYN providers, but not OB providers. Uh, on the active duty side, on a DOD facility, it's the unfortunate thing is that you are only there to treat active duty members. Uh, dependents are not eligible for chiropractic care, although recent legislation is moving in that direction that will open up the opportunity for TRICARE which is the insurance that DOD members have to for their dependents to have access to chiropractic care. So that's going to come sooner or later. There's been great traction on that over the last couple of years. And um, uh, lots of Congress members from both sides of the aisle have signed on to that. So I, I do anticipate that that would be an opportunity to uh, be able to focus on, um, you know, the dependents um, uh, of active service members. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one area that you can get involved in um, as a student is with our Student American Chiropractic Association. 
where we actually go to Washington every year, not this year, not 2021, but mm -hmm. um, where we lobby and we advocate for bills. And, and <coughs> the bills that we've advocated and lobbied in the past have been for TRICARE and the inclusion of dependents. And so I always tell students, if you think that you're going to treat active duty or veterans, it's a wonderful opportunity to get involved with the American Chiropractic Association and really understand the legislation that's there because you can make such a difference by helping to advocate for this population even prior to graduation. So um, you just made me think of that when, when you talked mm -hmm. about it. So, mm -hmm. so I, th I think that's it, Doc. Do you have anything else? And we can turn it back to Stephanie. Um, if, if there's anything else that you want to say before we No, I, I don't. I, I, again, um, you know, this is a great, great opportunity for, for all of you. Um, you know, certainly this is, when I was a student, this was not an opportunity and as i became closer to graduation i realized there was this was an opportunity and um you know i i made a sacrifice and and it was for great reasons i could have easily went into private practice when i graduated but i took a fellowship uh, for a very very low wage and i i you know out of that i, I met my wife uh, and i have my family but i also have what i consider the best job in the world and all of that was because I decided to do the fellowship and and try to stand out and do my best. And so, you know, I, I leave that uh, to you all is just to, you know, as you get into school and as you're working, do your best. You know, it's a temporary period of time that you're in school. Learn a lot, focus. There are There is no party or gathering that's better than you staying home and studying and being involved in activities, SACA, leadership, research, all of these things are going to set you up for success down the road. So, you know, if I can be a resource at any time, please reach out to me, um, jason.napoli at logan.edu or va.gov. I'm happy to answer questions, help you along the way, uh, but certainly as you enroll or come through Logan and you, you're looking forward to a clerkship, that opportunity is there for you not only in VA St. Louis, but multiple locations throughout the country. So best of luck to you all. Happy Veterans Day and um, be safe out there. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at Logan.